but I hope everyone is now present. And uh, secondly, um, I do wish to wish you a good morning uh, or a good afternoon or a good evening as ever is appropriate. And again, to thank everyone for their attendance. But uh, I was going to ask um, um, the uh, uh, Grace Karras uh, or, or Sir Robin if um, everyone is present now and we can proceed with this. Uh, th thank you, John. And yes, we're ready to proceed. And um, so we, we are. So now, uh, and is, is the chair available? The chair is uh, joining. She should be with us any moment now. If anyone has any... Um... I believe the chair is having difficulties in joining us. But is being helped, so should be with us shortly. Apologies for the delay. I was going to say, this is um, a subject which I'd be very grateful if people could let me know at the end uh, or uh, let the discussion know what they whether they think this is a subject we need to examine in, in, in uh, greater detail and how best uh, it's thought this can be made, uh, progress can be made uh, internationally on this subject, bearing in mind that um, litigation funders um, uh, do operate transnationally. And it is something where uh, getting the system so that it works fairly for funders, fairly for those involved in the justice system, and fairly for the litigants is such an important aspect. But Grace, are we ready to proceed? I've just received um, notice that uh, Judge Preska should be with us in the next two minutes. Oh, she's Good. just joining us now, actually. Excellent. I was going to, I wished everyone a good afternoon, um, uh, <coughs> Judge Preska, Judge Loretta Preska. It's wonderful to see you, a and I hope all is working well. Uh, we're looking forward very much to this session this afternoon, uh, or this morning, as is in your case, um, as it is such an important uh, subject to all commercial courts worldwide. Bearing in mind, I think, the amount of money that is now available for litigation funding and how uh, prevalent it is becoming in the courts. And we need to make certain we've identified the issues and have a way forward. But having said that, and having said it again, um, may I welcome you and ask and say how lucky we are that we have such a distinguished and experienced judge um, to chair this session for us uh, from New York. Thank you, Lord Thomas. And I will just mention that I am a living illustration of the need for technology training among judges of a certain age. Thank goodness, with the help of our Singapore tech staff, I've been able to get in. So thank you all. It's an honor to be with you today. Now, some of you might recall that when we met in New York, litigation funding was a radar issue on our screen. Because it's evolving so quickly, I, I think the most valuable thing that we can all do is share the experiences of our commercial courts around the world. And therefore, I will encourage you all to, um, to 
contribute and to give us your comments as we go forward during this session. Now, since we last met in New York, we've seen massive growth in third-party litigation funding. Um, as Minister Tang told us in Singapore, Singapore has adopted a light touch rule of regulation, primarily effected by guidelines. Justice Middleton of Australia told us in his paper about the proposals for rather strict guidelines in Australia, including disclosure of third party litigation agreements, securities for costs, uh, requirements that funders e uh, efficiently resolve cases, and I thought most interestingly, providing that funding agreements are effective only upon the agreement of the court. In the US, I can report to you that there is no uniform federal regulation. There was a bill introduced into Congress to establish uniform disclosure requirements for class actions and multi-district litigation cases. Multi-district litigation cases are where numerous similar lawsuits are transferred to one federal court for coordinated pretrial discovery and hopefully resolution. These kinds of cases are often product liability cases, airplane crashes, and the like. Now, many of the states have started imposing requirements on litigation funders. Some merely require disclosure of the fact of funding. Some require disclosure of the terms and conditions of the agreement. Some require uh, funders to register with the state. Some require the inclusion in agreements of various provisions and safeguards. Many states have abolished their champerty regulations. That is their regulations that prohibit third parties from taking a financial interest in a lawsuit. And many federal courts on an ad hoc basis are requiring disclosure either of the fact of litigation funding or of the terms and conditions of the agreements. So the question for us as commercial courts is what is going to help us best serve our customers? What is the effect of funding? So for example, we heard both Minister Tong and the litigation funder, Ms. Dunn, explain to us that in their view, litigation funding provides additional access to justice by providing funding to bring cases that might not otherwise have been brought. And I emphasize, they said, to bring meritorious cases that might not otherwise have been brought. They both also tell us that the litigation funding model is helpful in weeding out cases that perhaps are not meritorious. You will recall that Ms. Dunn said that her organization members fund a very low percentage of the cases that are presented to them. So the questions for us is how do we best serve our customers? What is the effect of litigation funding as we see it around the world? How do we maintain high standards? What is the role of the courts? Is there a role for the courts? Or as we now know, uh, should we rely on self-regulation 
as apparently we do in England and Wales. Um, and I can provide for you a, a personal question that is be, that I'm dealing with right now. That's another wrinkle on the litigation funding issue. In 2008, a group of investors purchased shares in YPF, an Argentine energy company. Uh, the investment vehicle through which these investors went in was called Peterson. And eventually Peterson entered bankruptcy. The receiver in the Peterson bankruptcy wanted to figure out how to fund the litigation of claims against YPF and Argentina, and therefore entered into conversations with Burford Capital. Burford, as you probably know, is one of the largest litigation funders and indeed is publicly traded in the United States. Needless to say, prior to entering an agreement, Burford did its due diligence on the claims. And again, needless to say, had numerous communications with the, YP, the um, Peterson receiver and with all of the lawyers. Now in the litigation, where the claims against Argentina and YPF are being litigated, the litigation funder has claimed that all of those pre-agreement discussions are privileged, either under the work product privilege or the attorney-client privilege. So as you can imagine, that is a massive amount of material. The briefing is ongoing, and I look forward to updating you the next time we are together. So, um, oh dear, did I go off? Um, I'm looking to find, find Judge, I'm looking still to there. find where I can see the people whose hands are raised. So at the bottom of the screen should be the participants tab. Thank you, Grace. You are a scholar and a gentlewoman. So ladies and gentlemen, let us begin by asking my friends around the globe, have you witnessed an increase in litigation funding over the past few years? Has anybody a view on that? And is it um, anyone? Chief Justice Morowitz from Ontario, would you be kind enough to unmute yourself? And tell us your experience. Thank you, Judge Prescott. I think that um, many things in Canada follow uh, from what your experience is in the United States. We're just a few years behind, but we certainly have seen an increase in litigation funding, uh, most notably in insolvency cases. There is no sort of formal regulation, but um, I think more and more judges on individual cases are starting to inquire um, disclosure of who exactly is funding. Uh, there has to be, I think, um, an awareness of the courts generally as to what are we trying to achieve because, um, uh, yes, it does provide access to carry forward meritorious cases, but quite often we're finding in, it, um, in the cases that we're seeing is that by the time the litigation funder is through with its funding agreements and its um, uh, recovery arrangements, there's very little, if anything, left over. Uh, for the other claimants who uh, who would be otherwise the, the plaintiffs in the action. And this is especially so when you're dealing with class actions, because there you've already got uh, a significant amount that goes to the party that is uh, uh, having carriage of the action. So it is an area that is definitely expanding. And I think is one that uh, as courts, we have to oversee 
a little bit more to ensure that um, recovery at the end of the day actually goes to some of the people who have been detrimentally affected. Thank you, Judge Preska. Thank you, Chief Justice. Who else would like to comment on what you see in terms of the increase or not of litigation funding? Um, Registrar Visser from the Netherlands, would you be kind enough to unmute yourself? Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. Um, we've seen a slight increase in funding, maybe also because it's more uh, uh, there's more di disclosure on the fact that there's funding, third party funding, especially in competition cases and in consumer class actions. And the latter is also encouraged by a recent EU directive from the European Union. Uh, you may know of it, was adopted in November last year. And every uh, European Union country has to um, to make it international law uh, at the end of June 2023. And there are some rules about litigation funding in it. It's not prohibiting litigation funding, uh, but there are some rules, uh, for instance, about conflicts of interests on influencing the decision of the client in the case or on um, whether it's a case against a competitor of the uh, the funder, those kinds of questions uh, are to be assessed by the court, and the court needs to have some kind of uh, measures they can take to uh, prevent those uh, things from happening. Registrar, may I ask you um, about the influencing the the views of the client? We heard in the paper from Justice Middleton from Australia that the litigation funder had to agree to efficiently resolve the case. Um, how do the EU rules work with respect to influencing the actual decisions of the actual client? Uh, well, the third party funder has to keep some distance from the client and from his lawyer where it concerns the contents of the litigation. So he's not to influence the decisions on uh, reaching a settlement or what position, uh, what legal position uh, the client needs to uh, take in a certain case. So those are the boundaries, I think, uh, when it concerns uh, you. That's very helpful, thank you. May I call on Justice Batts from, from Jamaica, please? And Justice, would you unmute yourself? Yes, well, it's morning here. So good morning, good night to, to all, as the case may be. My, my question is, how does it come to the attention of the court that there is third party funding? This is not a issue that arises generally in our jurisdiction. However, recently, and I mean in the last four or five years, one or two agencies actually advertise on national television offering funding for litigation. Um, one of which was actually connected by marriage, <laughs> so to speak, to, to a, a legal firm. And it caused a little disquiet in the community legal community that is. But my, my question is, how does it come to the attention of the court generally that there is litigation funding? And um, what is the, the mischief that is being addressed or should be addressed? Thank you. That's an excellent question, Justice Batts. Thank you. Um, speaking in the United States, some courts have, man some federal courts on an ad hoc basis have mandated the disclosure of either the fact of litigation and sometimes the entire agreement. States are considering various um, iterations of that as well, but it's only in most cases because the disclosure is required. May I call on Ms. Dunn, please? Ms. Dunn, are you able to tell us a little bit more about how your members 
find that disclosure of the litigation funding agreement is made. And ladies and gentlemen, you know that Ms. Dunn is the chairperson of the Association of Funders. Ms. Dunn. Uh, hello, and nice to see everyone. Um, so, so in terms of the disclosure, it does vary significantly, um, both across arbitral forums and by jurisdiction. And as you'll have heard, there are different rules which apply in different jurisdictions. Uh, so it, it really does vary jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And I think the, the good question that was just asked uh, by Justice Batts was, what is the mischief? that one is trying to address about funding. Because if you strip it right back, I mean, what are we doing? Somebody else is paying the bills. That's not desperately exciting on its face, but it's a question of, well, is there any other influence that is being uh, made by the presence of a funder? I think in those jurisdictions where you have adverse costs, of course, the defendant, it's usually the defendant, is interested in how their costs are going to be paid and they want to know that if the funding causes them to to face a loss because they successfully defend how are they going to be paid and certainly in this jurisdiction we have the section 51 provision which makes the third party liable so that was already in existence pre-funders uh, I think the question that one has to be asked is beyond that though if, if really all one is doing is paying the bills what is what is the concern and and i think most funders have no problem with the fact of their presence being disclosed because what they're indicating is that they think that the case is a good one so that's no bad thing for the funded party but the, but it's about a level playing field if if one is going to disclose funding then should we be disclosing insurance arrangements on the other side because that is a sort of equivalent for the defendants that their insurers are paying for what they do and, and that's usually quite opaque so none of us are that concerned about being disclosed it's just what's that about and what we do find is with those who are using funding such as corporates they might say well look we choose to finance all of the assets in our business just because we finance fund, uh, litigation why is that something that we have to disclose so this is always coming back to what is it we're worried about i think thank you so does anyone else have a comment on what the mischief is we are trying to prevent? Anyone? A provision which says What have you seen in terms of the effects? of litigation funding. For example, do you see cases lasting longer? Do you see and are you able to determine whether or not less meritorious claims have been weeded out? Can anyone speak to the effects of third party litigation funding? May I ask Chief Justice Morowitz from Ontario to speak up again and unmute himself. Thank you, Judge Preskin. Just following up where Ms. Dunn was commenting, um, you know, I think what we're seeing, certainly in Ontario, is that the cases where litigation funding is involved, there is merit in the case. And I think it speaks very much to the fact that uh, you've got experts in the field who have done their due diligence, as you outlined before, and uh, the cases that they choose to funding are the ones that they think they've got a substantial chance of uh, achieving a level of success. So I think it does it does serve the uh, the purpose of weeding out the uh, the uh, cases that have no merit. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Chief Justice Hope, please would you unmute yourself? Sorry to take so long in unmuting. Very great pleasure to see you again, Judge Preska, you after a very too. happy time in New York. Great pleasure. You too. It's I wonderful just... to see you too. And 
I'm glad to see that you and I are together in illustrating the need for technical training for all of us. <laughs> well, I'm a bit slow in getting to the right button. That's my problem. But I just wanted to go back to the mischief point, because um, in our court, uh, which is a very new court, we were designing rules and we applied our mind to that. And the thing that really seemed most important was to pin down the funder who usually has his heart in the right place to make quite sure that they would respect the court's rules, that they would respect confidentiality, and also they would make sure that the litigant fully understood the consequences of the agreement that they were entering into. And uh, the, the, the way we designed it was to say that uh, if there was any breach of either of these three cardinal rules, uh, then the agreement would not be enforceable. So the, the, as it were, the, 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 the way we could pin the funder down uh, to make sure these rules were observed was to make them sub subject to the jurisdiction of our court and then ensure that enforceability of the agreement depended on observing the rules. Now, we've no reason to believe that a, uh, that a, a well-disposed funder would find it very difficult. I don't think they would. And having listened to Ms. Dunn's presentation and the very respectable organization that she chairs, um, I'm sure that that is true of all of, us, all of them. So the mischief really is, is the, 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 the funder who's out of line with the majority and the litigant needs to be protected. We're not interested in the court ourselves in regulating these agreements, which is why we don't ask them to be uh, exhibited to us. Um, we don't want to know about them, frankly, but we do want to see that litigant is properly protected. So that's where we stand. Chief Justice, may I ask you one question? Um, if something is amiss, does the injured party have to come to you and seek relief? Or as in the proposal in Australia, does the funder have to seek approval of the enforcement of the funding agreement? Well, it's, it's a bit of both really. I mean, the enforcement of the funding agreement will be denied if we're aware that there's been a breach of the rules that we set out in our in our paper. So that's the that's one side of it. There's, of course, there's nothing to prevent a litigant coming to the court if something is going wrong and they wish us to intervene. Uh, we haven't closed the door on that, but uh, we, we feel that it's enough for us to set out rules with the enforceability as the key to provide the background to it all and let the system work out on that basis. Excellent. May I call on Justice Cockerell of England and Wales, if you would mute, unmute yourself and give us the benefit of your wisdom. Well, I doubt that there's much wisdom to give you the benefit of, but uh, I say that my impression is not so much that it weeds out the worst cases, though it may well do that. My slight impression is that we end up with more litigation in the sense that there are some cases which would otherwise be marginal, where people would have claims stifled, which get the benefit of the backing of funding, and so do not go away, and then are possibly fought longer and harder because of the better resources available with litigation funding. It's an impressionistic uh, view, but that, that seems to be certainly something that we see occasionally, people who would otherwise be dropping cases, pursuing them because they do get funding. Does anyone share Justice Cockerell's concern or have you observed an increase in perhaps marginal cases? Justice Cockrell, I think you are ahead of the pack on this one. Going back to what Chief Justice Hope said, he said that it's not any, the courts really don't want to be involved in this regulation. What do we all think about that? Do we think we are better served by court rules? Do we think that self-regulation by the funders is the key? 
do we feel that laying out very broad standards is the way to go? Or do we think that we have to require security for costs, permission to enforce, and the like? What do we think is required in terms of the types of regulations available? Or could we have a comment from Australia about the proposed rules? And I know uh, Chief Justice Alsop has seen a great deal of this. Any views on how the regulation and the type of regulation is working? Chief Justice Hope. I look forward to hearing you again if you unmute, you unmute yourself. Yes, um, it's an interesting question you ask. I mean, uh, the, the question is, should it be by primary legislation? As I think the Australian Law Commission is, um, is promoting or trying to promote, or is it left to the courts? Um, in the situation in which we're placed in Abu Dhabi as an offshore court, uh, we have to do it for ourselves. That's just the nature of the uh, regime in which we, we exist. But I, I don't see any reason why the courts should not make their own rules. If they have a rulemaking power, uh, then they can make their own rules and um, adjust those rules according to their own circumstances. Uh, one of the problems with legislation is it's quite difficult to change if it doesn't seem to be suited for the situation. And I'm a believer in, in the court can it, re retaining as much control over its own affairs as it can through its own rules or practice directions. And that's really the, the way we've approached it. And um, uh, of course, where, where we are in Abu Dhabi, uh, I think we have the practitioners on our side on that. We consulted them before we set out the rules and uh, the rules have their approval. So I, I would encourage the courts to see this as something that they can provide for if they're concerned about it. If there's primary legislation, well, that's fine. Now that, then the problem is solved. But I wouldn't wait for legislation. And I wonder whether the Australian courts can't uh, 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 be a little more forthcoming about this. I wonder indeed whether any of them have. I'm, I'd be surprised if New South Wales, for example, hasn't taken some steps to control the situation. Uh, I hope there are some on this at this meeting who might be able to enlighten us. Thank you, Chief Justice Hope. May I recognize Registrar Visser from the Netherlands and ask him to unmute himself? Uh, thank you, Judge Preska. Um, as I said, in the EU, the legislative uh, drill has been uh, used. So all EU countries have to pass legislation on this, uh, but in a uniform way. And I think that helps funders to predict the outcome of their involvement in proceedings in the European Union, um, as well as the European Court of Justice saying uh, if there are any inconsistencies in the legislation of the application of the legislation on third parties, they have the final say. Uh, whereas if it's left up to the individual uh, the judicial bodies of each member state, it can go either way and it's not good for multinational uh, th for third party uh, funding i think so registrar do i understand you correctly that the individual country courts retain no discretion to vary the rules is that right no i think it's correct yeah there uh, the the european um, directive uh, uh, prescribes for all EU member states how to uh, assess third party uh, litigation uh, and the, all the EU member states have to implement that into national legislation and there's no not a lot of leeway to uh, to uh, to to get to do it differently uh, that being said I think the the, uh, the restrictions in the uh, EU directive on third lit uh, party litigations are so broad that 
I can think of any situation that would not be covered by it. So I think it's a good thing that uh, in the EU there's a legislative process for this. And one more question, Registrar. Would you anticipate any difference in interpretation of the rules from country to country? Well, there is uh, an explanation, uh, memorandum of, of explanation for the uh, EU directive uh, that uh, outlines why these rules are implemented and what the background is. Uh, the rules are very clear on what the boundaries are for third party litigation. So I'm not expecting any uh, uh, large discrepancies between member states in implementing these rules. Uh, besides that, the Euro European Commission will also uh, ask member states to uh, send them their legislation, what they are proposing in their in their own country. Um, and the European Court of Justice, of course, has the final say. So I don't think there will be uh, much discrepancy between the, the member states. Thank you, Registrar. May I recognize Justice Charles Ramos, who has just recently retired from the commercial division in the New York State Courts. Justice Ramos, would you unmute yourself? Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, sir, speak loudly, Charlie. Yes, of course. Hi, Loretta, how are you? Excellent. Um, notwithstanding the fact that I've retired, I'm working harder now than I was when I was in the court. Um, I'm even working for the Circuit Court of Appeals um, in New York, the federal court. One problem that did arise before us in the commercial division, I don't know how common it is. Um, so many attorneys, uh, large firms anyway, are headquartered or have offices in New York that when a dispute arises between the funder and counsel, they end up litigating a dispute about the funding and the legal fee in New York instead of the court in which was handling the underlying case. So I had a case involving a, a litigation in Kentucky, and I ended up with a multi-year litigation between the funder and the attorney in New York. Uh, if and there Charlie, was... may I ask you, may I ask you, was that just a regular contractual choice of forum clause in the litigation funding agreement? I don't think so, but I, I think they just, we had jurisdiction of both parties in New York. So they brought the action in New York. I think council was a New York based firm and it was more convenient for them to do it in New York County. Uh, I don't know how common it is, but I like the idea for a number of reasons of having local regulations with regard to disclosure and the, the resolution of any disputes involving the funding to be handled in the court where that case was pending instead of having to export it somewhere else, somewhere else. I don't know if it's been a problem for other people, but it was a, a very um, contentious bit of litigation before us. And as I, under you. as I understand the proposal in Australia, because the permission of the court is required to enforce the funding agreement, it would necessarily be in the court where the litigation took place. I like that. I do. I see that. Who nice else on this everybody. topic? <laughs> Charles, go ahead. No, I'm fine. I'm done. Thanks. Thank you very much. Ms. Dunn, do you have any views on that problem? The problem of the enforcement of the contract being uh, litigated in a different court from the court in which the underlying dispute was litigated? Yeah, well, it's a it's a good point, and I and I agree with Judge Ramos that it's much better that the judge who was concerned with the dispute as a whole, who has the full context for it, should actually decide that, if you like, side issue as well. This comes up more in um, in arbitrations where you've got different governing laws for disputes and things going on than we find generally in litigation. So things emerge from arbitration matters which then have to be decided elsewhere and that's not always wholly satisfactory frankly because you don't have the context of the thing as a whole and and so i think that is 
it is much, much better to have the thing dealt with entirely. If I could just, just touch on one other just small point that was raised by the Canadian judge about the question about the parties not coming away with enough at the end of the case. I think it's a really important point to focus on um, about the values of claims. In our experience, and I speak as a lawyer, um, lawyers aren't very good at figuring out what claims are worth. They tend to overestimate what they are worth. They tend to underestimate how much it's going to cost to complete it. So we will say no to funding cases, which might well win on liability, but with a disappointing amount on damages, relatively speaking, such that um, although the funder is perfectly legitimately entitled to take what they take, it's a disappointing outcome. We want funding to be something which everybody goes away going, well, I'm glad I did that. Um, and that the claimant, the funded party, walks away with the majority of the outcome. So we're very testing about values of claims and budgets. Those are the two thorniest issues in a funder's life. May I ask you one other question, please, Ms. Dunn? What is your reaction to Chief Justice Cockerell's concern that because the funding is available, we, the courts, might find ourselves with more cases that might be marginal? Yes, I think it's, it's an interesting point. Uh, I, I still believe that we weed out a lot of things. I still hold that true. I think what that boils down to, like anything in life, is those more marginal cases are most likely to be taken by people who are relatively new funders, who are quite inexperienced. I've been doing this nearly 20 years. I have to say I'm deeply conservative, having had lots of uh, uh, quite tricky experiences along the way of things that don't turn out, particularly the value beef. Um, and I think Justice Cockrell may have a point, but in relation to those who are less experienced, but in life there are people who are less experienced about lots of things. Um, I still think that the relative number of cases that are funded is very, very small. Um, and I think some of the higher profile class actions, et cetera, can tend to make it seem like there are many more funded cases than there really are. Justice Cockrell, I know you want an opportunity to comment. No, I just wanted to come back and say, you phrased it as a concern that I raised. I'm not sure it was intended to be that. I think my point was in part that some of these cases which are borderline on the merits and somebody has got financial issues would previously have been stifled either at the initial stage because they haven't got enough money to start or because when things get tough they haven't got enough backing and so you may get more litigation but a number of these claims will turn out to be good ones so it's it, there may be an aspect of concern, but there's also an aspect of this being a thoroughly good thing. Exactly. Justice Ramos, would you unmute yourself, please? Got to find the right button. Is the, are, can you hear me now? Speak loudly, Charlie. Okay. I, I you, Loretta, you you brought up a point, and I don't recall if if Ms. Dunn addressed it. Do, do her contracts provide for a, uh, a, a uh, an agreement to, as to jurisdiction as if there's a dispute with regard to the funding agreement itself? Ms. Dunn? If, if, if counsel and, and, yes. and the fund. I, yes. um, we, we do. I, I, must, I must say, maybe I'm lucky, um, we don't have many disputes but yes in our in our contract i mean that's lucky us we have i will i'll just i'll just what so we do yes we put a governing law clause in the in the contract in the event that there's a dispute but we're very fortunate we don't have that i will tell you though i have just in january had to give evidence for the first time in my life as a lawyer in a case where the funded party got together with a defendant to make out that the outcome was zero when in fact 100 million pounds had changed hands so we had been defrauded so that's a whole other matter where we were in the uh, English commercial courts to try and hopefully sort that out so the life of a funder can be an interesting and varied one 
Ms. Dunn, are you able to give us a little more detail on that case so that we have a little better knowledge? Um, so we, we funded a dispute between two parties who had had a big property development uh, scheme. Uh, what the defendant had agreed that he would pay a share to the claimant, he didn't. Um, and so we funded the claimant to recover what was a substantial sum from the outcome of a hugely profitable um, property transaction. Um, things are proceeding in a very positive direction for the for the proceedings, but unfortunately the, the claimant and the defendant then got together and made out that they had had a drop hand settlement and keeping in mind the whole point that we've been referring to, which is we don't run the case, we don't have any say in when the matter is concluded, it was only then that we discovered that that was not true and that 100 million pounds had changed hands. And we, we had funded, I think our costs in that case were about 10 million pounds. Um, and so we were entitled to a share of those proceeds. And that is what this long fight has been about to get back our entitlement to the proceeds that we funded to the tune of 10 million pounds. So, yeah, it's um, all sorts of things can happen as a funder. It's not an easy way to make money, What people, no matter what people might think. It's never a dull moment, though. Thank you. Justice Batts from Jamaica, would you unmute yourself and give us the benefit of your wisdom? Well, well it's just a, a, a question. I'm, I'm curious to know how far these regulations go. Do they apply to the grand aunt who decides to fund the litigation of her grandson who has been dismissed from his place of employment. Is the target is that individual people who lend a friend money to finance litigation? How, how far do you go with this? Ms. Dunn, can you give us a, a sense of the range of cases your members see? Yes, and you know, it's a really good point, Justice Batts. If you look at the jurisprudence in England, actually a lot of it came out of, uh, there was a, a politician who was uh, involved in a, a slight scandal where he was funded by a third party and the things that came out of a defamation action and the jurisprudence came from there. On the whole, um, the types of cases we are funding are large commercial disputes. They are not the type that you describe, but there will be some who might, that might fund more uh, on the consumer side of things. The association in the UK is very much a, um, in England and Wales, sorry, is a, is a commercial funders organization. Uh, but you, you raise a good question in terms of where do these regulations apply and, 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 and in what context to, to govern what's gone on. I mean, the, the reality is we didn't abolish Champerty here when we had the uh, or Justice Jackson review. And when with the, he, was, uh, he was soliciting views, I said, no, don't abolish it. Because if you do, you'll have to replace it with something else. The whole point of that was, we need to have something which suggests that if the aunt is badly influencing the nephew or the son, um, which she shouldn't, if she's just going to give him the money, there should be no strings attached, then he has some comeback to say, auntie, stop. And, and so Champerty and Mason says that those principles are there, regardless of anything else, for you to point to and say, this is what is happening. So it, it, it's about just trying to look at things realistically. All we ever say is a level playing field is, is all we're looking for. Thank you so much. Chief Justice Hope, would you be kind enough to unmute yourself and give us your wisdom? Chief Justice Hope, I think you turned off your video, but you didn't turn on your microphone. And I thank you again for making me feel good in my technical inabilities. Chief Justice Hope, any um, 
progress in unmuting yourself. Yes, I hope I'm now unmuted. Um, I'm sorry, yes. I pressed the wrong button and lost the connection altogether. I just wanted to add to the hazards that Miss Dunn was talking about. Um, it's really just a, a bit of storytelling. There was a very important group action case uh, where the um, funder was successful, the party who was funded was successful, and it was a very large claim indeed. And uh, the funder then sought to enforce it in Hong Kong. And it became, raised a very difficult issue there in Hong Kong, bearing in mind the extent to which um, uh, the Chinese government uh, looks at things. And um, the Chinese government uh, invoked sovereign immunity. And the Hong Kong court had to decide whether sovereign immunity applied, and they divided 3-2 in favor of the Chinese government. <laughs> and so the funder had got a great deal of money, the one place he could really enforce it. They were denied enforcement. So I'm afraid it is a hazardous business, and, um, uh, and uh, in a way that's why um, the, enforcement, the enforcement test, which we, or rule rather, which we apply, is rather important because we do realize that enforceability of the agreement and also of the award is crucial to the success of the business that the funder is running. And may I ask you this, um, one of the, the goals of the commercial courts, as I imagine we all agree, is to uphold the highest standards. So the question is, do, does our, if we the courts retain power over the enforcement of the agreements, do you think Chief Justice Hope or anyone else that that will help us uphold the highest standards of conduct. If you would unmute yourself, Chief Justice Hope, please. Yes, I would hope so. And I must say I'm very encouraged by Ms. Dunn's contributions because it does um, indicate that there is a, a body of, um, of hunt funders involved and standards are set within themselves. And the courts, uh, I think uh, for myself, we start with seeing that as an advantage. And we've no reason to believe that the, the rules which we lay down will not be observed, that we do expect them to adhere to our standards. And um, that, uh, I'm afraid we can't uh, uh, police the agreement between the party funder and the funder other than by the enforceability of the award. But uh, I think that carries the thing a very long way. And I would hope that um, that is enough. Have you had instances where your court has refused enforcement? Well, we have not. We're, we're a very new court, so I, I can't claim I have any experience other than simply the acceptability of our, our rules. But I would be very interested for those who have more experience than we do uh, as to how often they have reason to doubt that the standards are not being observed. Um, I, I'm not sure how big a problem it is, really. Maybe in the United well, States you have more knowledge than we do. I'm sorry, Chief Justice. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Not at Maybe, all. Um, Chief Justice Moore was from Ontario and asked him to please unmute himself. Thank you, Judge Preska. And again, a, it's probably more of a comment, and I was very interested in Ms. Dunn's comments, but I think really some of it really reflects the maturity of the market in which Ms. Dunn is operating. It's certainly you know, far more mature than what we have in Canada. We'll catch up, um, but I think that the courts have a role at this stage in sort of overseeing to ensure that there is a, and I think it's the level playing field that Ms. Dunn uh, referenced a couple of times in her remarks that, you know, the courts do have a role in ensuring some degree of fairness, but I think in time, um, much of what's happening in the UK is going to be replicated in Canada, which is a, a more mature market, and the, the parties really respecting each other's positions, and you get to uh, negotiated results as opposed to uh, litigious results. Um, but, you know, that is going to take time. Currently, what we still see is a little bit of a struggle uh, between uh, the funders and um, and sometimes their counsel and interpretation agreements and also funders and those who have been, uh, uh, who would have originally been the plaintiffs in an action, just having their, their share of the pie being decreased over a period of time. Exactly. Thank you.
I have one more question. I'm looking for a little free personal advice. Have any of you faced the issue of whether the pre-contract communications between the funder and the claimant are privileged? Anyone? Chief Justice Marwitz, please. Uh, that is um, very much an issue that's in dispute. Uh, and, uh, you know, funders uh, quite often will want to, uh, they will disclose the agreements to the court, but then they'll ask for a sealing order. And uh, sealing orders in Canada are very much, uh, you know, there is some guidance from our Supreme Court, but it's really in a non-commercial setting and we have to try to adapt it to a commercial setting. And uh, right now on an unrelated matters, not involving funding, that matter is up uh, likely before our court of appeal uh, as to you know whether there should be any difference. But that's how um, many of these issues are being addressed right now. The commercial courts have been uh, quite willing on occasion to, to grant such sealing orders. Excellent. I look forward to hearing the developments. Ms. Dunn, would you be kind enough to unmute yourself? Um, I just so just a couple of points on privilege. We're, we're fortunate in this jurisdiction that uh, the common interest privilege is very, very well regarded. So there has never been any attempt to challenge that in terms of the exchanges between us and a funded party in the discussion. We put in place at the very outset a, a common interest privilege and confidentiality agreement to ensure that that is the case. So it just deals with it. But I do recall a very early case that I funded in the United States because the, it, because the uh, contract was governed by English law, there was a question about privilege that was raised. And because we were able to point to the fact that the whole, the whole agreement was governed by English law, we had an English barrister submit a, 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 an affidavit about common interest privilege and that dealt with it. And it has always seemed to me that it, is, it would seem impossible for somebody to secure funding unless they could be completely open. And we want them to be open, warts and all, about their case. But I know that it's not quite the same as the sort of doctrines that you have there from work product to whatever. It's, it's hard. But I suppose my, my point is, how can we get the truth and how can we fully investigate if we don't have everybody being unafraid to share and answer questions correctly? Yes, ma'am. Um, Justice Ramos, may I ask you to unmute yourself? I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, this we is can, but question. speak loudly. Yes, this is another question I have for Ms. Dunn. Uh, in my capacity as a court-appointed mediator, I would like to know if the funder has any input in terms of coming up with a compromise. I, I asked the, the defendant to, to make an offer. There's a, there's a demand from the plaintiff. Let's assume that you're funding the plaintiff's claim. Um, do, uh, as the funder, do you have a role to play in determining what would be an acceptable settlement? Um, yes and no. So the no is because we are not, we're very clear in our code of conduct in this jurisdiction that we are not entitled to dictate settlement number so it's not a yes or no from us as to whether an offer is accepted all of that said usually the funded party comes to us and says well what do you think and of course we will say well at this stage under the agreement you owe us this much this is what the outcomes will look like defendants often assume and mediators sometimes assume we have a greater role than we do so sometimes we'll get asked to attend a mediation we go it's not much point because it's not down to us um, but they think, I think part of it is they want us to know what's going on so that we're fully, you know, blessed with the facts of everything that is going on, which I think is a good idea because uh, we don't, never want anything to be hidden. We want to have all the full facts. But in this jurisdiction, it is absolutely clear that we have no right to do so. The only thing that we think we're allowed to do is in our funding agreement, we have our own mediation provision that says if the funded party has acted against its own legal advisor's legal advice, 
we can agree to refer that to a mediator. Again, in nearly 20 years, we have never exercised that provision. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think we are getting to the witching hour. Grace, am I right? Well, we don't know. Director, then, if I if, yes, if please. I chip in. We we are getting to the witching hour. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you, and I appreciate the insights that you have all shared. You have made us all so much smarter and given us so much more perspective. In the interim though, until our next meeting, I hope that you will report interesting regulations or whatever comes up in your jurisdictions so that we will continue to be involved and continue to be aware of what is going on. Thank you for allowing me to be with you this morning. Good morning. May I, on everyone's behalf, thank you, uh, uh, Judge Loretta Presco, for chairing this uh, very interesting session. I think we've all benefited greatly from it, uh, and it's particularly kind of uh, it's done to come along and speak to us. And I hope this liaison between the commercial courts of the world and the major funders can continue, because I think it's to the mutual benefit of all. We properly understand issues that arise. Uh, but this, I think, brings the session to an end today, um, and um, we begin at various hours tomorrow morning. It is terribly difficult spanning the entire world, uh, and that's why, unfortunately, on this occasion, we didn't have anyone from Australia, which seems to have got the uh, <clears throat> more uh, developed uh, legislation in some areas. Thank you all very much indeed, and we meet again uh, tomorrow at a time uh, that will vary from time zone to time zone. Unless there's anything else, Grace, that we need to say, we'll bring the session to an end. <laughs>